democracy is facing its most serious crisis in decades. That is the warning from Freedom House. It's a Washington-based group which promotes democratic practices around the world. Now, this group said that 2017 was the 12th consecutive year in which global freedom had declined. Freedom House says that President Trump's attack on the press and the judiciary have serious implications for the health of American democracy. The report also said that China and Russia have taken advantage of the retreat of leading democracies to increase repression at home. And it says that countries like Myanmar, Turkey and Poland are among 70 countries where democracy has been eroded. Let's discuss this further with Professor A.C. Grayling, philosopher and founder of New College of Humanities. His recent book is called Democracy and Its Crisis. And I'm assuming, Professor, that you agree with these findings. I do, I'm afraid. Where do we start? Where is the crunch point? Where is the crisis? Well, the interesting thing about uh, it is that there are many different reasons why democracy is uh, uh, under threat. And the, the very plurality of, of these sources of difficulty makes it difficult to see what the remedies might be. So, for example, in the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, a, a, a big factor in what's happened in our democracies just in the last 12, 18 months has been the effect of social media and the way in which um, uh, information harvested from social media can be used to do what's called hyper-targeting of messages to small groups so that you can get information or misinformation out there into the minds of people in those groups and you can influence the way they vote without them realizing that they're being influenced. So that's one kind of thing. Actually, it may very well be the, the major factor, at least in what happened in those two countries. But in the other countries, the difficulty is that the uh, uh, fact of global terrorism has meant that many countries have introduced laws that limit civil liberties, that uh, increase the powers of security forces to act against terrorist threats. And this has meant that a certain license seems to have been given to uh, governments, societies in general, to press down on dissent and on disagreement. And the whole point about democracy, of course, is that it lives on dissent and disagreement, on debate and discussion. And if you confuse democratic discussion with threat of unrest and terrorism, it becomes too easy to make the democratic process a weaker one. Are you referring to people like, say, President Putin and President Erdogan in that case? I am indeed. Those are the two primary examples of those. And there is also another threat as well, which is that since the Second World War, since 1945, the majority of countries in the world have either become democracies or uh, pretended to be democracies. And that's because they saw the great model as being presented by the US and Canada and Australia and the Western European countries. If you want to be rich, successful, influential in the world, be a democracy. But now there's another model on the block, and that's the model of uh, China. And China has been hugely successful economically over the last couple of decades. Uh, and people look at it, people in the developing world, for example, look at it and they say, you don't have to be a democracy to be economically successful. And in fact, if I was the president of a developing country somewhere, I could think to myself, well, I think I could stay in power all my life long and have a successful economy. And so this is a, a, another factor which is entering into this rather complex picture. But you, at the very beginning, you spoke about social media, and I'm refer assuming you're referring to the EU referendum in the UK, for example. But if people are voting, if they're not happy with the way that democracy is treating them within their own realm, if they have the opportunity to vote in a different way, is that not perhaps testing democracy and showing that democracy is in fact working? I know we're talking about populism here, but is that not the test of democracy? Well, a, a great philosophical answer, yes and no. Um, I mean, <laughs> Yes, in the sense that, of course, you have this problem in all economies, whether they're advanced or not. And that is that all economies are always in transition. So there are always people in an economy who will be feeling left behind because things are changing, things are moving on. Some uh, sectors of the economy are getting outdated and others are, are coming on stream. And with the introduction of AI and robotics in car manufacturing, for example, there are tensions that arise and you can actually see these in geographical pockets of, of, of people who are worried in those areas. But then the other difficulty is that if you get, as we've seen in the last third of a century, an enormous increase in the gap between rich and poor in societies, inequality being a very serious matter, you get a potentiation of that quite otherwise normal 
transitional characteristic. And we'd love to talk more because that's another topic that we desperately want to talk about. But sadly, we are out of time. Professor AC Grayling, author of Democracy and Its Crisis, thank you so much. And thank you to watch for watching. Get in touch with us on social media.